Hello and a warm welcome to Talking Stocks. I'm Kukule Tukele. In studio with me, Sean Ashton and Liam Hechter, both from Anchor Capital. Now today we're talking Chipotle, which is a Mexican grill, a chain of restaurants which is situated in the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Germany and France, specializing in burritos, tacos and other Mexican food. Gentlemen, good to have you uh, both. I'm not too sure if you might get hungry by the end of this <laughs> conversation. But this company I've never heard of before, but uh, quite familiar with burritos and tacos. But just how big is it in comparison to some of its peers, Sean? Okay, so to give you some context, I mean, it's what we would call a fast casual dining chain. So not quite full service sit down restaurants and not quite the McDonald's type of model. And their, their whole... The whole uh, reason for existence, really, the way they would put it, is that they supply much fresher food than their peers. So it's produced mm. kind of fresh in front of you. You can choose your ingredients per, uh, per taco that you're looking to buy. Um, uh, and to, to give you a context around the size of it, there's, uh, it's, a, it's a $14 billion market cap company. Been growing quite rapidly in recent years. Mm. Uh, that compares to about $110 billion for McDonald's. So it's much smaller. It actually came out of the McDonald's stable originally. Um, uh, and there's about 1,900 stores principally across the United States. Uh, and if you think about it, relative size, McDonald's has got 35,000 stores. So much mm. smaller business, but growing quite rapidly, what has been growing quite rapidly in the U.S. market. I understand that this growth, though, in the U.S. market has also impacted on the share quite significantly. Uh, erratic behavior in the pricing there. Liam, what's going on there? Well, I think in, in recent years, as it went through the sort of early stages of its growth and, and then the, obviously the explosive stages, the market applied a, quite a high multiple to the earnings. Um, what you've seen has been perfect execution out of the management team up until now. They've built a powerful brand, especially amongst millennials in, in the US. Um, it is geographically diversified, but I would still say definitely in the region of 90% um, US. And, and it appeals to, to the younger guys looking for the more sort of health conscious fast food. Like yourself, because <laughs> you've eaten there. So tell us about the food, how was it, and the service too? Well, it's being a fast casual restaurant, you kind of walk up to the counter, you see what you want to eat in front of you, you pick, up, you pick out a few things and they make it in front of you and then you, you sort of carry your own plate back to the table or you take a takeaway. So that would be the more fast casual versus pure fast food where you don't really want to stick around in a restaurant. Mm. Um, but also what's appealing to, to the customers is that they, they are incredibly conscious about things like antibiotics and, and GMOs and food products. Mm -hmm. So. A, l a lot of the guys these days that are, that are worried about what they put in their bodies, they would rather eat a Chipotle than, than something like McDonald's. I understand that that very same uh, uh, cause, the, the concerns rather around the uh, gen genetically modified foods, also questions the scalability of the business. Uh, is sure. that also hampering growth there? So, so I think this is one of the issues that you've seen this massive growth path that's taken place and they've been rolling out 180 odd stores a year which translates into about 12 percent new space growth every year and at the same time you've had comparable store sales growing at about 10 or 12 percent as well so you've had 20 percent compound growth for sure. a while now but i think they're getting to the point now where uh, i think it was about a year or so ago they started to to warn of possible shortages of uh, non-gmo pork as an example where they, they you know they want to source from sustainable farming practices and, and ultimately if you're creating a big business if you start running t into shortages of certain types of ingredients um, that that can call into question the ability to to scale your business model up mm. but more recently i think that's that's one of the roadblocks that they've hit um, of late and then the you know the, the more topical news in the last six months or so has been uh, this issue of an e coli scare that's taken yes. place in a number of the restaurants around the u.s where reports have suggested about 500 people have gotten sick from eating at Chipotle, but the Center for Disease Control in the U.S. has confirmed uh, separate cases of about 53 individuals that have got violently ill from, from eating at a Chipotle. Sure. So, so this, is, this is creating quite a problem for them right now in the sense that it's created a lot of national media coverage um, and their same store sales have come off significantly. They've actually gone backwards. Having said that, doesn't this add further pressure on their margins too? Because if you're looking to source organic goods, that does come at a bit of a cost there. Absolutely. So I think their costs are going to go up because also what they're incurring in the short term is a lot of, you would perhaps argue, once-off costs to try and test to find out where these bacterial infections are coming from in their food. And we, you know, it most likely arises out of the, the fresh side of their produce mm. as opposed to the cooked meat, etc. Um, and it's, co it's forcing a bit of a change in their business model because they're now having to backtrack a little bit and say, okay, we used to prepare every single item on site in the restaurants. Now we're going to have to have a central kitchen to, to dice the tomatoes and distribute that out to third party uh, or, or to, you know, distribute it centrally to all of the restaurants 
um, uh, and have some central controls in place. So that, that kind of dilutes a bit of the appeal around fresh food mm. um, and, and ultimately we think this process is going to result in extra costs that they will have to incur to get their processes streamlined and, and, uh, and, and the health checks in place. Coming back to the share price, I take it this is why you consider it to be a, a bit too steep and the valuation a bit too high, uh, given these ongoing risks in the near term that are quite present. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, think, I think that's fair. Um, we first looked at Chipotle about a year ago when it was firing on all cylinders, you know, the single store sales growth, which is arguably the more um, impressive number that comes out of Chipotle over recent years and, and probably the, the critical metric that we look at when we look at Chipotle is how, how it's doing on a like-for-like -like basis. And um, we felt that the market wasn't pricing in the risk involved with, with providing GMO free food because ultimately your supply chain, something could be happening on one of those farms. Mm. There's no way that you're going to be able to control that um, without there being any hitches. So we thought that what happened was, was probably justified and it was due for the market to see that there are increased risks with selling this food. And, and ultimately what, what you've seen is a pretty merciful millennial that's, that's kind of trashed the brand now. I mean, they're, they really are going after them and, and the, what's happened is that the stores are empty, the you know, social media has, has been played quite a big role in highlighting how empty the stores have been. Sure. And we think that at the moment the market still hasn't priced in the fact that revenue isn't going to grow anywhere n near where it was growing. So if, if expectations had to be reduced and looking fair, uh, what I think to put some numbers to it. So the share price got to a high of $750 or so. Um, they'll probably earn about $15 a share in this uh, year that's just passed. That's mm. the year to December 24, uh, 2015. Um, expectations for the coming year are about $12.70 or so, so about 14% down. But what we know is that they've already guided to the final quarter of last year. And that implies their, their growth projections imply that the final quarter shrank by about 45% in terms of bottom line profit. And uh, unfortunately, the same store sales trends have worsened throughout the quarter. So for the, for the full quarter ended 31 December, their sales were down about 14.6%. But by the end of the year, they were tracking down 37%. So maybe you see a bit of a recovery off that deep base. But when you look at the expectations for the coming year, mm. the market's basically implying that by the third quarter of this coming year, they would have, only, they would have recovered to the extent that the year-on-year -year change is about minus 10. I think that's far too aggressive. I, I think it's likely to be worse than that. And, and we think that a reasonable earnings expectation could be about $10 a share for the coming year. So the share price has come from $750 down to about $450. It bottomed at about $400, and it's bounced back to $450. But you're still placing a 45p multiple on what they're likely to earn this year. Mm. Now, yes, it's probably fair to assume that if they get things right, there, there'll be some recovery off that base. But I would argue that the, the recovery is not going to match the pace of growth that they've achieved over the last five or ten years. So if you look at the average rating over time, it's been kind of a 40 trailing PE. Um, I think it's got to be lower than that now. And even if you're putting a 30 times multiple on this year's earnings, um, you, you're landing up with a share price of the order of $300, which is still a third down from where we are now. So it's fallen a lot, but I think the starting base was too high. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, we, we would argue it still looks expensive. And is the com company rather implementing strategies that might look to offset some of these challenges going forward? Just looking at their website, you can order your food online or using their mobile app. You know, is this enough to continue appealing to the market that they're hoping to attract even further? So I think w one of the initiatives they've, they've come up with is to, you know, is, to, is to have a policy in place that prevents sick employees from coming to work. Because um, you know, one of the issues that they picked up outside of the uh, e, coli, e. coli issue was a, a, a Nova or norovirus, uh, which is related to people being sick mm. and spreading germs into the, into the food. Um, so now they're saying, well, actually, if you're sick, you mustn't come to work. But yeah, you know, I, I think there's, and, and maybe, maybe that starts to have traction with consumers, but I think there's a way to go before consumers fully recover the trust that they've that they had before in this brand exactly well let's quickly get your views then uh, with regard to this particular share whether to buy hold or sell the stock liam buy hold or sell chipotle i think um it's due earnings downgrades so what you're going to see now is the momentum of earnings is, is probably going to come down from where the expectations are at the moment so on the back of that, in the short term, I would say that there will be a better entry point. So if I was holding it now, I'd sell it and then I'd, I'd look. Possibly when, when single store sales start bottoming out in terms of going backwards, then I think that the, this management team will sort of re repower the brand up and, and people <coughs> arguably maybe will 
you know, have faith in the brand again and, and it'll provide a great entry point into what has been a, a, a great success story really in the US restaurant industry. Mm. Sean, your views? Yeah, I think that's, that sums it up pretty well. I mean, uh, the, the first point I'd make is that this is actually a very good business. It, it's, it's had a great brand and I, I'd still say it's got a good brand, but they're going through a tough phase. Um, my key issue with it is that the valuation is not factoring in the risks right now. It hasn't fallen far enough. If it fell f far enough, we'd probably consider being buyers of this thing because mm. I think that fundamentally it's a good business. Um, but the, you know, as we've seen with previous examples of uh, food safety scares that you've had in the fast food industry, it tends to take longer than you think for consumers to regain their full trust in, in, in the brand. And I, I don't see why Chipotle would be necessarily any different. So we think, it, we think it's a good business. We think it's overvalued still. Um, and it still has to go through this uh, cathartic process of you know, bottoming out and then improving off that lower base. Exactly. But for someone who has slightly of a more conservative view yeah, and for wants right, to get right exposure. Right now for me it's a sell. It's a sell for yeah. you. So would you suggest that maybe an investor with a more conservative view gets exposure to another stock which is larger like McDonald's which has shown a sustainability in its Potentially, earnings? yeah. Indeed. Well, we'll leave it there for today and hopefully we'll get a taste of uh, what uh, Liam got to experience with Chipotle. But there we have it uh, this uh, week for the view on Chipotle. It's a hold or sell coming through from both our experts today. A big thank you to both my guests, Sean Ashton and Liam Hechter, both from Anchor Capital. Do be sure to join us again next week where we talk more stocks.